you very much. Um, I especially want to thank the organizers inviting me. Uh, I feel very, very brave. Uh, maybe I was brave to accept. Um, I'm a multiple theorist, mainly, and uh, so I have been working on topological field theory and in some sense, of course, uh, string theory is part of that um, for a long time, uh, but I have never given a talk to this sort of audience. So what I hope to do is really have a talk, uh, since it's also late, which is in two stages, in two parts. Um, the first part is going to be quite gentle, uh, nearly a review uh, of uh, and an overview of uh, topological methods, homotopy theoretic methods in uh, TQFTs. And then the second part I want to um, talk about something uh, quite recent. Um, and if you by then have lost me, that would be a good time to come back because I will start again. Okay, so part one. Topological field theory, I want to set up uh, the uh, sort of the situation I'm uh, talking about. So it's very simple. Uh, this is a definition that Atia gave. Um, we look at the cobordism category. Uh, I call it board delta D in this case, the discrete bordism cobordism category, because we are going to talk about another one sooner or later. So the objects are just uh, closed manifolds of D minus one dimensions and uh, morphisms between two such uh, manifolds, M0 and M1, are given by cobordisms. So the boundary of um, the cobordism W is M0 union M1, and we have, uh, that's supposed to be a map, uh, a cobordism, um, a morphism, I should say, from M0 to M1. Now, in this uh, discrete version, we don't take all cobordisms W, but we are actually modeling, um, modding out, we only take a representative for uh, one element in the diffeomorphism uh, um, class. Namely, we mod out by all the diffeomorphisms relative to the boundary. Gluing is given, uh, gives us the composition, and so uh, we have here, very simple, if if this is M0 and we have a cobordism to M1 and another uh, cobordism from M1 to M0, then of course the um, composition is given by this union glued together. Okay, so then a topological, a D dimensional topological field theory is simply a functor of this uh, cobordism category to the category of vector spaces. And of course, uh, there are some uh, extra conditions. The cobordism category has disjoint union, so that disjoint union is supposed to go to tensor products in vector spaces. And here's the full theorem that should be uh, quite familiar. If you have a two-dimensional TFT, then all such things are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, to finite dimensional commutative Frobenius algebras. And the correspondence is simply given by uh, a TFTF corresponds to what evaluates, uh, it evaluates on the circle A. And on this F of S1 A, we have, of course, the multiplication. Uh, no, this is not working. The so multiplication here uh, is just given by pairs of pants. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. There we are. Multiplications is gif uh, given by pairs of pants, an inner product by uh, the cylinder, and uh, the next, the uh, S um, surface is, of course, telling us that this inner product is non degenerate um, and um, because it's uh, equivalent to the identity, we are in a topological field theory, those two things are topologically the same, so the cylinder is the identity functor, and so in particular our algebra A is finite dimensional. And of course there's a similar argument for commutativity, etc. That's something to keep in mind actually for later. Um, 
in the meantime, I want to go also look at a slightly different setup, namely for conformal field theory, Siegel roughly at the same time. Rather than looking at topological fields, you, uh, you might want to um, remember a little bit about geomorphisms, and he um, defines this uh, category of Riemann surfaces, M, where the objects are just the one-dimensional manifolds, so circles, and the morphisms are again given by cobordisms, now though equipped with um, an a conformal structure. So a cobordism here is a surface um, and thought of as a Riemann surface with, um, of course, M0, boundary M0 and M1 and uh, composition just given the same way by gluing. And a, a conformal field theory is, uh, is defined similarly, only now, of course, uh, we have, and that's the important part here, the morphism spaces are uh, Riemann surfaces, modelized spaces of Riemann surfaces. So in particular, they have naturally a topology and uh, one wants to think, uh, carry that. Now this is actually quite a hard uh, definition <laughs> in the sense that it's quite hard uh, to find uh, examples and work with. So let me then yet introduce another notion. Uh, it's quite not quite historically correct the way I introduce it, but never mind. Uh, topological field series were considered, of course, in order to, well, one uh, her reason was by Atir, in order to get invariants of manifolds. But uh, the inspiration why this should be right or would be helpful was that uh, TFTs should be local. So locality is a very important thing. And so, is let me actually use my hands rather than doing anything else. Before you took a whole manifold, uh, a closed manifold, and cut it in this way, one way, uh, along, say, the x-axis, but now you can also, there's no reason why you can't also cut it along the um, y-axis. So not just cutting like this, but also cutting like that. And if you do that, of course, then surfaces, the um, intersection points, uh, the cut points, come down to a zero-dimensional manifold. But in higher dimensions, you continu continue, and you cut even further. So you get these blocks of manifolds, and really, um, you, it's a very simple way of thinking of a higher dimensional category. Namely, I want to think of this as giving uh, you really a two category where I can glue not only along the x-axis, pushing things that way, but I also can stack uh, things along the y-axis. And indeed, uh, in general, a uh, k-category is just something, really, if you start with a k-morphism, they have k different ways of um, gluing things together, either in, well, in k different directions, and you might think of it as being stuck together like a k-cube. So this is the um, inspiration, and we can find now, uh, of course, a cobordism category, which has starts with zero-dimensional um, manifolds, bodism between those are one-dimensional, bodism between those, two-dimensional, and so on, up to dimension D. And that's the so-called extended bodism category. And in order to define a TFT in this extended sense, we of course have to replace the vector spaces also by some sort of appropriate higher dimensional category. So uh, VD here just stands for some, your favorite, uh, default symmetric monoidal category. And uh, the cobordism uh, uh, hypothesis for this setup was uh, given by Brian Stolen, namely that such a functor should be determined up to weak equivalences by just what happens at a point. Okay? The so zero-dimensional manifold is a point, and everything should be determined by what happens there. Okay, so here's the example you uh, might have seen. If you just start with a, a zero plus one dimensional uh, theory, then you just have points and you have lines as um, uh, cobordisms. And indeed, to a point, you have to associate a vector space V. And um, while the point comes in the oriented case, comes with two um, well, uh, decorations, plus and minus. And so to the minus point, you associated B dash. 
And one goes through these uh, different bordisms. You have an E for the uh, interval curve this way, uh, E star for the interval curve the other way. You have the S version of our morphism, which should give us the identity. And hence, a, a V is clearly finite dimensional. And the circle, indeed, gives you um, a map from the a C to C namely the empty manifold to the empty manifold and will give us the dimension of V. So really, uh, it's not very difficult, so I probably didn't do it carefully enough. It's not difficult to prove in this case that indeed uh, V is um, determining V dash and everything else is determined by that. So clearly the uh, Kubotism hypothesis holds in this case, however, it was a conjecture for a long time, and um, it's quite hard, actually, to prove. Indeed, in the way I said it, it's not proved today, but it's proved in a more complicated way. So once again, if you can't solve a problem, sometimes making it harder or more complicated seems to be the way to go. So, in this case, I'm going to introduce yet another cobordism category, which is more complicated, but that's actually more flexible and hence more um, amenable. So, this is the, in, uh, I call it enriched TFTs. So, before, uh, so we had the Atia version and uh, the Atia version of the extended cobordism category, and this, in some sense, is the extended version of Siegel's category, whereas the morphisms half now topology. That's the way I think about it. So I want to look at the enriched TFTs and the uh, objects are now D minus one dimensional embedded um, manifolds. And so M0, I think of it, well, I have say one line, the x uh, axis is fixed and then I take a point and over that point I have an infinite dimensional um, vector space and in this infinite dimensional vector space I have an embedded M0, non parametrized an embedded M0 and similar sometime later at uh, point B maybe I have M1 and uh, again it's embedded in this hyperplane. And in between, I have space for my cobordism to sit with the right um, endpoints. So this cobordism is an embedded, well, it looks like a surface here. In general, it will be a d-dimensional manifold with the right boundary conditions. That has a natural topology. And then I'm going to write down actually what it is more precisely. So the homotopy type of the space of morphism. So in my bordism category D, I have uh, objects M0 and M1, and I think of them, as I said before, but at some point you can think it as 0 and at 1, if you like. And then I'm going to look at as a disjoint union of all the um, cobordism um, types, all Ws, and they are going to be embedded, smooth embedded uh, Ws into this um, infinite dimensional space with the right boundary conditions and fitting in between M0 and M1. So now these are parametrized, but I have the free action of the um, diffeomorphism group of W on this, fixing the boundaries. And so I let it just act by precomposition on this embedding space. And so what I get is actually just a model for what we call the classifying space B diff W. Because the embedding space, even with the boundary conditions, is weakly contractible. That's the Whitney embedding um, theorem. Okay, so basically there's so much space, if you like to think of it, uh, uh, there's always uh, somewhere you can push your manifold uh, and um, it's a contractible thing. Okay, so um, this is an interesting space in itself because, of course, from a topological point of view, we are interested in uh, B of the diffeomorphisms of manifolds, so uh, that's bonus in a way. Now from uh, this extended uh, topological um, 
bodism category, and I need to take the framed bodism category. I'll come to that in a moment. We can now think of uh, that going into some appropriate topological, um, indeed you probably want to call it an infinity D category, and uh, Hopkins, Lurie, Lurie uh, um, proved the cobodism hypothesis, so I should really also mention Ayala and uh, Francis's work, um, and I'm sure we hear more about it uh, later on. Um, giving another um, proof of this theorem. What is the theorem? Of course, uh, the functor uh, is determined by what happens on a point, and the, um, furthermore, uh, any uh, the object, f of a point, which is an object in Vd, is fully dualizable, and su any such fully dualizable object uh, is going to give such a functor. Okay, so now I have uh, here s stated the simplest case, namely in the framed version, and indeed there uh, are uh, generalizations, non-orientable, orientable spin, etc., which leads me really to an aside. Tangential structures in this context are uh, a little bit uh, tricky, but um, worth thinking about. So, what is a tangential structure? Let's recall that the uh, n-dimensional vector spaces on uh, a manifold W or even any space are in one-to-one, -one, up to sorry, up to homotopy, <laughs> are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, to the maps from W into B O N, or if you like. Uh, another model of BON is, of course, the Grassmannian of n planes in uh, R infinity. And the correspondence is simply given by, well, uh, a bundle uh, E corresponds to the map um, theta E, and really I'm pulling back E, I want to think of it as a pullback of the canonical bundle over the Grassmannian under the map theta. So, what is the tangential structure? The most general setting is, well, I take a vibration uh, B O N over B O N, call it uh, total space X N, and call the map theta N. It's a fiber bundle, and a theta N structure on my manifold W D, which might be different than N D, is actually a lift of the uh, tangent bundle uh, map from W to o, uh, B O, uh, where E, well, sorry, it's a, it's the, uh, I'm looking at the map B O uh, to B O N, it's a classifying map for E, where E is actually the tangent bundle of W plus uh, an appropriate dimensional trivial bundle to get up to N. Okay, so um, in the oriented case, I'm looking at uh, the map uh, SON uh, into BON, and in the framed, of course, in the uh, OEO, the Stiefel manifold into the Grassmannian. So, in particular, we can see that SD is um, EON framed whenever N is greater than D. Okay. So now, this is a sort of the step uh, which is the most uh, crucial for the talk in some sense. Um, we have these categories, um, and I have to say, <laughs> when I first started this some 25 years ago, I was a postdoc of uh, Graham Siegel and hadn't, uh, hadn't studied um, field theories at all. Uh, but I had studied uh, K-theory, and what you do in K-theory is you don't study the category underlying but you study actually an associated space, topological space. And this is really what I thought I'd try in this case. So what is the um, classifying space of a category? It's very simple. You start with, uh, you give yourself a point for every object and you give yourself um, an interval for every map. And then if you have a commutative or uh, a composition from A to B to C, F composed with G, you give yourself a triangle for any such commuting um, pair, triple. 
um, and so on. So you build up uh, your classifying space, and of course here you identify appropriately the uh, boundaries, and that is also called the nerve construction and the realization of the nerve. In the case when the category is just um, a point with the um, G as its morphism, then you get what in the classifying space BG. Now there are a couple of things to note in this uh, construction. First of all, um, do you remember all of the category? Probably not. In this case, uh, F, which is quite crucial for our, the talk, you know, the f uh, map, the morphism F from A to B goes to an interval, which is fine. However, intervals can be reversed. If you go from A to B along that line, you can also go back. So you're actually homotopy inverting every morphism in your category by looking at the associated classifying space. That's the important part to remember. On the other hand, you might think that's bad news. Maybe it is. <laughs> the good news is uh, this classifying uh, space functor does remember a lot of the category. Namely, for example, if you have a monoidal category, then because uh, products of categories go to product of spaces, etc., you actually get uh, a map of monoids, of spaces. And um, say if your spa um, classifying space is actually connected, then you get what's called a uh, loop space. Uh -huh. it's, you can write it as a loop space. If the um, monoidal structure is actually braided, then you get something that's called an E2 space, or if it is connected, then, or group-like, then you get a uh, double loop space. And uh, best indeed is if your category is symmetric monoidal, like all our bodism categories are, then you get an E infinity space, or when you group complete or you know, look at connected components, you get an E infinity space. Okay, so now with this sort of setup, I can now uh, actually explain um, a theorem that um, we proved some 10 years ago, and it came out of uh, work on the uh, Matson. Weiss theorem or uh, the Mumford conjecture. Okay, so we look at the bordism uh, category, dimension D. You take the classifying space and we can determine precisely what this infinite loop space now is. It looks slightly uh, horrifying, um, complicated letters, but let me concentrate on the uh, right hand side. It's not really so complicated. Because what you do is you take, um, if this works, I'll give it another. Ah, yeah. You start with the Grassmannian manifold or d dimensional um, planes in R plus d plus n uh, dimensional Euclidean space, okay? N is the co dimension. Then, of course, that has a universal d dimensional uh, bundle over it. And instead of looking at this d-dimensional bundle, you look at the uh, orthogonal complement. Now, that is now an n-dimensional bundle. You take its uh, tom space or one-point compactification, and you get this compact space here, which is the tom space. And now you're just taking maps, pointed maps, from a d plus n minus one sphere into this space. And there's an easy way to um, take this limit. It's not complicated, okay? So that's really all of it, and I should have really written down. The cohomology for exists, for example, uh, rationally, is very easy to calculate. Basically, um, it comes down to be um, something, uh, polynomial uh, functors in the homo uh, homotopy groups of, sorry, in the homology groups of the Grassmannian manifolds, which we know. So it's very simple by the Tom isomorphism theorem one can prove. Uh, the rational cohomology of this. So really, we actually do understand this, even though it looks a little bit complicated. We do understand it. Um, those um, used to uh, Tom spaces, etc. I'm just noting here that the Tom 
class, the fundamental class in some sense, is in negative dimension, um, 1 minus d in this case. And of course, um, the way I stated it, uh, I stated it for oriented cobordism um, theories, but you can have a similar theorem for any tangential structure, as I defined it before. And um, it's a very similar formula where uh, you replace now this uh, you know, complement of the uh, universal bundle just by the pullback under that theta map. So it's very similar. Okay, I want to yet give uh, a slightly more general version of this because we did talk about higher dimensional categories and I did say, you know, uh, cobordism categories rather than just cutting it up in one direction, you can cut it up in another direction and in more and more the higher dimension. So if I do it k times, so if I look at the k uh, category, on cobordism K category, or K full category in our case. So I can have four direc uh, K directions, K cubes effectively. Uh, I can compose them in K directions. Then I can uh, look at the classifying space of this. And indeed, uh, what I get is just a D loop of the one that I had before. Um, D loop meaning, and there's just a shift. You might have noticed there was a minus one before because I've looked at the one category and now I have a minus K. So it's really quite simple again to understand. And this is supposed to be our uh, example. Okay. So um, just to get, get more feeling for this, if I uh, go all the way to the extended version, that means I start with zero manifolds. Um, and of course, I can have a zero dimensional manifold and a one dimensional. So this is just a one category. And I can take its, um, its classifying space and so on. But I clearly have these inclusions of higher and higher. So I can add the two uh, dimensional cobordism, then I add three dimensional cobordism, etc., all the way up to D and go on. And then I can uh, take their classifying spaces. And interestingly, in this case, what I get is actually, I c um, well, I get a filtration of <coughs> the classical Tom cobordism uh, space, infinite loop space associated to the Tom spectrum. And I'm starting out with the, um, well, this is the infinite loop space associated to uh, suspension on um, S zero, I guess. Uh, so, and these are just the shifts, as I've noticed, uh, noted before. And in the framed uh, case, I just note here for later, I just get actually a, um, a constant filtration of this to um, the framed cobordism category, which we know is the same as the stable homotopy theory. Okay. Enough of this for now, I will we'll come back later on. Then. Okay, so I don't just want to get a hint of how you might actually prove the theorem. Let's say, go back to the uh, first one, namely that uh, the classifying space of the bodism category, uh, the simple one, gives you this infinite loop space. Okay, so where is the geometry coming in? And why does it help that we, are look, we looked at uh, manifolds embedded in Rn, right? So, remember, an element in our cobordism, uh, of our morphisms, from the empty to the empty, is actually a closed d-dimensional manifold, okay? That's represented here by the blue uh, line. And it's contained in some neighborhood. Uh, represented by the gray bit, uh, in Rd plus n. And then that, of course, the neighborhood of uh, W, I can identify with the normal bundle relative to this embedding. So, given this <laughs> element, the embedded W in Rd plus n, I now have to find a map from Sd plus n into the compactified um, 
um, orthogonal complements of the Grassmannian, right? So what do I do? I use just use the Tom collapse map. I look at this picture. I send everything outside um, the gray area uh, to the base point in here. And uh, indeed, this factors over the normal bundle of W compactified at infinity. And this normal bundle, you see, is every point here can I can describe as a point in, uh, in um, my manifold W and a, a vector orthogonal to its, uh, to its tangent space, yes. So a point here is determined by a point X and this normal uh, V to the tangent space, which is yellow. Okay, so where do I send this information? I just send it to the tangent plane, which is, of course, now d -dimensional, a d-dimensional plane, and I remember v, and that's giving me an element here. That's all I do. Now, for those who know the normal Tom collapse map, this differs slightly in the sense that I here look at the tangent uh, at um, x, tangent bundle, while in the um, Tom, in his original setting in the 50s, looked at the normal bundle. So it's just a slight difference. Okay. Right, so what does this now have to do with field theory, t uh, t um, TFTs? Well, um, one thing is, and I have to admit, I started off being of this, you know, ask the naive question, if you have a functor from bordism to, so say, some vector space uh, category, then that gives you induced functor on the classifying spaces, and so you can just ask yourself, is this shadow in some sense, does it see something of the original theory? I think slightly better probably is, um, certainly has been more useful, is asking the following. Uh, what about can I somehow factor f through this classifying space, and what would it might might it mean to do that? And this is actually the um, answer Hopkins gives as a definition: an invertible TFT is actually something. So an, it's a functor um, from. I'm looking at the extended bordism category, so starting with zero, uh, to some D category um, V, uh, infinity D category. And I call this invertible if indeed it maps to this subcategory. This is a Picard subcategory where the objects are invertible relative to the tensor product. Okay, I have some tensor product in this uh, category, VD, it's a metric monoidal, and I want it to be invertible. So in the vector space category, it would just be lines, of course, um, but it might be something more complicated in general. And so in particular, not only are you know, the objects invertible, but also all the morphisms are invertible, et cetera, et cetera. And then on this side, I have a um, canonical quotient category, um, it's sort of the largest quotient, which is Picard, while this is the largest subcategory, which is Picard. And so, um, really, um, by universal property uh, of this quotient, I have a factorization of my map from here to here through this um, quotient category. So, um, now, it's not too difficult to um, convince oneself that uh, this functor down here is indeed uh, equivalent to give such a functor, is equivalent to give an infinite loop space map from the classifying spaces. Because now, because everything is invertible, I don't lose any information by applying the classifying uh, space functor. So really, actually, um, it doesn't matter whether I work on the categories or indeed on the classifying spaces. And because classifying space functors preserves all the um, extra um, uh, structure, indeed I get an infinite loop space map. Okay. So in their recent uh, preprint, um, Fried and Hopkins look actually 
add such functors on your own spectra, so I should notice this, uh, uh, notice uh, infinite loop spaces, the category of infinite loop spaces is actually equivalent to the category of a uh, connected spectra. And so they work with spectra, well, I talk about infinite loop spaces, but it's really the same thing. So they look at, uh, and trying to look at an in uh, sort of a universal exa example, I'm missing actually a cross here, sorry about that, and it should be this category. Um, they're looking at a universal example of such a category and they're uh, suggesting uh, these um, Anderson dual categories, which I won't go in at the moment. Okay. So, and they compute them as well. So, good. Okay. So, rather, I want to actually uh, do something uh, very simple that I can do very quickly. Namely, I want to prove the hy cobordism hypothesis from what we have for invertible theories. Okay. So I look at this extended uh, cobordism uh, category, the framed one, and I have this uh, VD, which is supposed to be uh, an infinity D category. I know on classifying spaces it gives me an infinite loop map, and we calculated the uh, classifying space in the framed version to be just omega infinity S infinity, so uh, maps from an N sphere to an N sphere, but higher and higher dimensional, which is in the category of infinite loop spaces, really the free object on a point. So Q S, uh, Q infi sorry, omega infinity S infinity is the free infinite loop space on a point. So really, this is an infinite loop space, so it will be determined by what, where the point goes, right? So this map BF is determined by what it does to a point. And so really for an invertible TFT, this is the story. Okay, right. Part two, if you have lost me, <laughs> and this is a good time maybe to come back. So I've, uh, we've tried to argue that invertible TFT can, well, most naturally be studied by infinite loop spaces or spectra and our knowledge of these MT spectra. Um, we all, what I also want to now look at is that I could just start uh, t look at TFTs and look at them as space uh, valued functors, okay? So um, we always have to think about what the target category is, you started, we started off with just vector spaces, but I mean, the first thing, because we have a topological uh, category, you might think, well, maybe spaces should be the na most natural first uh, target. So the question then is, can we somehow understand what we associate to, um, say, a sphere, a, a D, um, D minus one dimensional sphere? That should be D minus one, sorry rather than 2D minus 1. So w you can ask yourself, you s remember, in uh, a TIA setting, uh, a 1 plus 1 uh, TFT is just a, well, a finite dimensional com uh, commutative Frobenius algebra, meaning that f of S1 was, give uh, was giving me this algebra and uh, or this vector space, and this vector space had all this additional structure. So the same way you can ask, what is f of, say, a sphere in the most general setting when we have a space-valued functor? So um, that is, in some sense, the question. And the way to study it is, is actually by looking at the operat associated to the cobordism category. Um, so an operat, in that sense, it's just looking at a subcategory, OK? I'm just looking now at a subcategory of the cobordism category. Because what uh, we really, um, you know, to say I have a TFT is just saying that I have loads of different sort of multiplications, all right? So operats are exactly the right language for that because operats just codify multiplications from a n to a, and indeed we want to study these um, uh, such op um, operations in families families called V of N and how they fit together and how they might 
uh, codify notions up to homotopy. Classically, of course, this goes back to um, the 70s when we, uh, topologists were studying loop spaces and indeed um, here you have a classical example, namely the little n-disk uh, operat. You know, so uh, an element here is actually just an embedding of some n-disk in some uh, other n-disk and you can compose them and uh, this gives you the operat structure composition. And um, But the operats had really a renaissance partially or mainly maybe uh, uh, through the influence of uh, mathematical physics and we we'll, uh, now look at this uh, CFT example. So uh, we're looking at a really a sub um, structure of Graham Siegel's um, category of uh, Riemann surfaces. And I'm looking at, uh, so I want multiplication, anary multiplication. I'm just looking at all the uh, Riemann um, modelized spaces with n incoming and one outgoing boundary, right? So that gives me ways of multiplying n things to one thing. And this is, of course, a, a picture of what the structure of the maps might give me in that setting. Okay. So. You can ask then yourself, if I look at a CFT with a target spaces, what is the extra structure I get on f of s1? And this is what I want to answer. And the answer is quite general, so I uh, want to answer it in terms of operats. Namely, I want to uh, take an operat, the most general one, uh, and think about this one of uh, Riemann surfaces, if you like, as your main example. So I have these operations given by uh, Riemann surfaces of genus G, and I have uh, these compositions. Now, the one condition I do need is some very weak homotopy commutativity. Namely, I want some sort of A infinity operat, some sort of homotopy associativity uh, that ends up in V, a map from such a thing in uh, V, which is past connected. Why? I can tell you right away, I want to take the classifying space and I can only do that if I have some sort of multiplication and I want to apply the uh, group completion theorem for which I need some very weak homotopy commutativity. And now this is a crucial condition and it's a bit strange. Um, what I need is that if I have, think about the Riemann surface case, if I have n inputs and I glue in, say, uh, the base point, so glue in disks on the boundaries, then I, I get something that has zero inputs. And this map has to be a homology isomorphism uh, in degrees that um, rise to infinity with um, g, the index g. Okay. Then, in this situation, we proved, this is with uh, Bastera, Bobkova, Ponto and Jäcker, we proved that any such uh, operat with homology stability takes actually V algebras, so things that are operated on by V, to infinite loop spaces. And the group completion uh, functor uh, makes sure that we actually get an infinite loop space um, rather than, um, well, the, the problem is always with connected um, you might not have a group-like um, structure, so you need to group complete. Okay. Here's a small aside on group completion and the group completion in homotopy theory. What I mean by that is, of course, just taking the classifying space of the underlying monoid and then takes the loop space. So for a group, it doesn't do anything really up to homotopy, but of course, uh, in general, it might do a lot. And the only reason you don't, you have some control is when you have this very weak homotopy commutativity and you have, uh, in that case, the group completion theorem. So the group completion theorem allows you to um, relate the homology of this group completion of M with the homology of something related to M. Then you just take things up to infinity, right? So the 
homology actually in this setting is very closely related to just taking, well, it is just taking um, the limit of these uh, amends. Okay, so the uh, classical examples, of course, is the uh, infinite um, loop space opera that we uh, know from the 70s, uh, or fifth, yeah, earlier. Um, namely, in that case, the uh, C infinity n, the little n cubes in, um, well, the little infinity cubes, I should say, are a contractible space with a free sigma n action, of course, and so clearly going from the enary space to the zero or any other space is going to be a homotopy equivalence and particular homology equivalence, right? There's nothing there. In the CFT example, this is actually a deep theorem. I want to glue in disks onto the modelized space and go from uh, mg n plus 1 to mg 1. And this is uh, okay because the homology of the space, which is just the same as the homology of the mapping class group, is indeed independent of n and g for g large enough. Now, the reason uh, we got excited about the uh, previous theorem is because, I mean, this is something I had looked at uh, earlier, but uh, the previous theorem is exciting because we now can ex uh, apply it also to these higher dimensional uh, manifolds. Um, and this is, uh, I take now in dimension 2k, and notice I can only do it for even at the moment, uh, I take sk cross sk, take connected sum, so this is the generalization of a genus G surface, take out n disks and that my is my manifold Wgn. Okay, there's something, I look at a certain structure, namely a k-connected cover, and um, now I can define this modelized space of uh, Wgn's with theta structures as a, uh, a, well, it's a generalization of the one for the modelized space of Riemann surfaces, but um, it's basically, um, it's roughly speaking a, a B, diff, um, B diff of the manif underlying manifold. So, this gives us an operat, which is really, um, and a random, uh, Galassius and Randall Williams have proved the appropriate homology stability uh, theorem in this context. Now that's a hard theorem. Ours is now, of course, just a corollary of what I said before and of this theorem. Namely, that these uh, are indeed again operats. And let me finish by uh, just this last corollary, which is sort of the point of this last bit. Namely, if I now look at the uh, Bordism category with theta structure in dim even dimensions, 2k, and I look at a, um, well, a, a functor into spaces, which um, preserves, of course, is symmetric monoidal, etc., then the space that I associate to this sphere, 2k minus 1, has extra structure. Namely, if I group complete it, it so first of all, it's a monoid up to homotopy. If I group complete it, then it is actually an infinite loop space, which is actually rather more than you possibly could expect. And furthermore, if, if you think of this as a group, a fluffy group, rather large fluffy group, then it has also a compatible action by this large and fluffy group. So there's a lot of extra structure, and um, I guess my, my final point is maybe we should think of um, stable homotopy or infinite loop spaces as something related to uh, TFTs also more generally. Okay, thank you.